So, one of the most controversial topics in Jewish law has been for a long time now um, the place of women in halakha and Jewish law and in Judaism in general. Uh, I want to know, I want to um, stress that this video has been something I've been intending to do for quite a while now and it's not in response to recent events such as the RCA statement or whatever other things are going on now in the Orthodox world in regards to women as rabbis or things like that. It is rather a uh, statement of a view, my view, the view of, uh, of numerous people um, who follow the general view um, of the halachic legal positivists, or better way, for lack of a way to put it, or halachic legal positivism. And I'll explain what this is, a very important part of the video, before I get into the views on women in halacha. Now, I don't want to get too involved in many halachic issues. I will touch on one specific halachic issue in, uh, in some depth, if I can. Um, Whereas other halachic issues is not really the purpose of this video. Perhaps it'll be the purpose of, of um, other videos, but rather the view of rather than permitted, forbidden. I want to get involved in the question of should or shouldn't policy questions. Even though I don't usually get involved in this, but there is a need to. There's a very strong need to because I believe the halachic problems are not problems which are the ones which are debated the most. I think that people who study halakha uh, of any stripe are aware of, if they know the laws, the rules, sorry, of halakhic study, they are aware of the many halakhic arguments for or against or whatever the case may be. So rather this is a question, I will discuss policy, I will discuss uh, halakhic positivism. So, We'll start with halakhic positive, uh, legal positivism. The legal positivist view is that, well, according to, as is stated on Wikipedia, um, the, uh, the legal positivist view is summarized as whatever is on the books, like whatever is legislated, no matter how... Um, no matter how crazy it is, right, the law is based on the sources, not on the merits, right? Or as they quote here on, uh, they quote over here, in any legal system, whether a given norm is legally valid and hence whether it forms part of the law of that system depends on its sources, not its merits. This is quoted from John Gardner in uh, 2001, Legal Positivism, Five and a Half Myths in the American General Jewish Prudence. Okay. So that is a summary of what it is, is that in other words, legal positivism is the idea that the law is based on the sources. This doesn't mean that it is against, it is opposed to common law, it doesn't mean that it's a civil law system necessarily. What it means is that the law as legislated remains that law until it's changed. Um, but that's not the main point of legal positivism, halakhic legal positivism, the way I see it. To me, it's a very different point. To me, the, f the main point is, is that everything that is permitted is permitted, everything that is forbidden is forbidden, and whatever it, you can't prove is forbidden is by default permitted. And we have many, many sources to back this up. Um, so before I get back to the original point of that law being halakha being based on the sources, so we'll go through this idea that everything that isn't forbidden is automatically uh, permitted uh, until un you prove otherwise. So the number one source we have to start with is a Mishnah in Yadayim. In the Sechet Yadayim, it says over there, famous is the source of the famous uh, rule that Kola Mahmir Alav Lahaviraya, that anyone who is stringent, it is upon him to bring a proof for his words. 
So on this Mishnah in Masechet Yadayim, there is a Tiferet Israel. Tiferet Israel is one of the Perushim, a famous Perush on um, Mishnah, and he states that this applies in even a Torah law, even a Deoraita. Because the Torah doesn't ever come along and tell us what's permitted, it comes and tells us what's forbidden, because it restricts, it doesn't have to permit. That tells me by default that everything is permitted until the Torah says it's forbidden, right? Or you can prove from the Torah that it's otherwise forbidden. And the cases which you do have of permissiveness is usually as an exception to something else. You find this also in the Talmud very, very often. The Talmud doesn't have to say something is permitted. When it does say something is permitted, it's usually because it's an exception or because you may have thought because of a separate law of forbidding that it may have been forbidden. So in other words, everything is permitted unless you can prove otherwise. And we have in the Yerushalmi, we have a statement. Uh, I can't remember which Masechet is offhand, um, but it's rather famous. It says, uh, just like it is forbidden to uh, purify, to say that something is pure when it's impure, uh, uh, similarly, it is forbidden to um, make impure that which is pure. Similarly, in Rabbeinu Nesim Gaon's uh, Viduim, which was uh, stated by Sephardi Jews on Yerim Norahim, and as was once pointed out to me, is stated by Ashkenazim who do Seder Yom Kippur Katan. So it says over there, one of the Viduim, one of the things that person uh, says his, um, he, uh, one of his supplications uh, out of repentance is that as, a, as he states, that which you have permitted, I have forbidden, and that which you have forbidden, I have permitted. So, in other words, we find numerous sources again and again that not only is it wrong, it's even forbidden and something that a person has to do a repentance for it to uh, make up for that which he. Uh, prohibits the permitted or permits the prohibited. Now, permits the prohibited, we know, because you're obviously going against the law. But prohibits the permitted means you are essentially adding to the law. That's that is um, that is forbidden. So then we find other sources, like for example, the, 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 in the Talmud it says, "Kolam of Korea." Anyone who adds subtracts. By adding, you consider to be subtracting from the actual law. You are the same as someone who permits the forbidden, because whenever you add, you are always subtracting. You change the meaning of the law, the essence of the law. Um, similarly, we have the statement um, uh, in, in Talmud, Lo dai lachamash asra Torah, you know, it's not enough for you what Torah forbade. We find also the Nazir, yes, yeah, so the Nazir he has to give a korban, uh, uh, he has to give a sin offering. And things like this, people who take upon all these these uh, things which the Torah did not prohibit and they make them into prohibitions. So that is in violation of the principle of halachic positivism. Now, a lot of halachic systems, or ways of seeing halacha, don't really accept halachic positivism. They don't accept the law's law. One of the outcomes of saying that everything is by default permitted until you prove it's forbidden, in other words, or everything that you, in other words, proof comes from where? From sources, from the stated sources, the authoritative sources of Am Yisrael in Halacha, in Jewish law. And they are, of course, only things which are uh, enacted by a uh, for the nation by the national Bedin, the Sanhedrin, as we know, that's the Chamim very clearly. We you know came about Vasitim Kacholish Yerucha is talking about a uh, Bedin Gadol, as we see clearly from Misach Toreot, Misach Sanhedrin, also similarly a Bedin of a local community. And by the way, this we'll get back to this because it's very, very important for the uh, topic which we will discuss. Uh, a bit later on. So they 
have the authority to make well the national court has the authority to make national law and the local court has the authority to make local law um, with the uh, proviso that these uh, authorities are accepted by the people people have to accept their authority in order for their words to be binding okay so that said the people may think that this is very regressive because the only nationally accepted work that we have is Talmud. Uh, Talmud was the last uh, fully universally accepted Jewish law. Um, nothing was ever universally accepted since as authoritative as the last word on Jewish law. Indeed, it's even Talmud's not the last word. If we have another court, another great court, they can go against Talmud or even Mishnah. So, the question is a question now of, um, of policy. So, the view of people who think the way I do is that when it comes to women in halakha, it's not a question of what women should and shouldn't be doing. Should women be rabbis? Shouldn't they be rabbis? Should they do this? Should they do that? Should they wear to fill in? Should they not wear to fill in? It's a question of is it permitted or is it forbidden? Right? If women are allowed to wear to fill in, then they may. If women are allowed to get an aliyah to the Torah, if the tzibur is mochel on tzibur, then they may. If women are forbidden from saying a beracha on a mitzvah, that they are not hayavot in, then they may not. It's not a question of should or shouldn't. There's a question of forbidden, permitted. If it's permitted, that's their choice. If it's forbidden, okay, it's still their choice. But but nonetheless, the only question should matter. Jewish religious leaders is whether it's halachically permitted or forbidden. There is no precedent, no precedent in Jewish law for judging someone on the basis of their intentions. It doesn't exist. We don't, we don't judge on the basis of the intentions. Sorry, that you, that the rabbi see. Like for example, when orthodoxy sees that um, uh, they see that it's not lishma, it's not for the correct purpose, that, that, that a lot of women around don't like. Persons. Well, that may or may not be the case. It's completely irrelevant. The question is, on what right do you have to restrict someone from something which the halakha permits them to do? If the halakha permits them to do, which we'll, 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 catch, we'll touch on, we'll discuss it. So, to people who think like me, it's not a question of sh should or shouldn't is not the concern. The question is only forbidden, permitted. So um, let's uh, let's look at an example. There's a certain I think double standard in orthodoxy. The halakha, as stated in Mishneh Torah, but even stronger in Shulchan Aruch, because Shulchan Aruch takes these two halachot and he puts them next to each other. The first halakha is about women learning Torah. He quotes almost exactly word for word from Rambam uh, that um, that women are not obligated in. Uh, in studying Torah, and that a, a father shouldn't, and doesn't say forbidden by the way, it says shouldn't, it's very important to note this, in other words there's no halachic prohibition, lo yelamed adam et bitot Torah, it says a man shouldn't teach his daughter Torah, why? Because most women uh, are not uh, trained, are not trained in, lo, uh, trained to, to study, lo not lehit lamed, is the is the language used. They're not trained to study and hence when they're going to kind of study so they're going to um, take the words of uh, the, the Torah and make it into you know a joke and in, into you know Havai um, as if it's worthless as the Chamim said someone who teaches his daughter Torah it's as if he taught her blandness something with lacking flavor. Now it's very clear that, and as many poskim, like the Chida, and um, nowadays very commonly, uh, according to uh, Rav uh, Chaim David Alevi, uh, a whole, whole host of people have stated, uh, the Drisha famously in Pirush on the Tour says that this is talking in a case where they're not Mechuba not, Rav Nashim, most women, but as soon as they're Mechuba not, in other words, they are capable of study, 
then you may teach them. Now, the double standard that I mentioned is that the next halakha stated in Tzuchar Ruch um, is the halakha about teaching a Talmud She'eno Hagun. It says very clearly, Asur Lamed Talmud Talmud She'eno Hagun. Ela Machzirin Oto Lemutav. Yeah? It is forbidden to teach a student, a male student, who is not fit. He's not hasn't done teshuvah. He is over averot. He's not religious. Whatever it is, it's a sur to teach him the Torah. First, you must return him to the correct path, and then you put bring him into the better midrash. And then it continues. Someone who teaches a student who is not fit, it's as if he threw a stone to Marcolis, a, a one of the others around an idolatry, where they throw stones at it, which is far, far worse than the statement uh, about teaching one's daughter, it's as if he teaches her to flute. Ah, but here we see all the Kiruwar organizations and all the Yeshivot are so happy to accept Talmudim She'enam Mehuganim, that they don't have mid proper Midot, or they, they, they don't keep Torah up properly, they... they they behave like as who knows what, and yet, no, okay, it's great to say it about them, even though you are breaking halacha by teaching them Torah without having um, them return into Shuvah first. That is the halacha. Now, whether that is an easy halacha to keep it nowadays, or whether we should keep it nowadays, or whatever, that is a different question, or whether we can keep it nowadays, um, because most Talmudim are not Hagunim, and in that case, no one will learn Torah. Fine, but the double standard is still there. You cannot judge a whole half of Judaism's uh, uh, intentions while ignoring not only the intentions but the actions of the whole other half. You go and you tell a Devar Torah to someone who clearly doesn't care about Judaism, or you debate an atheist, or you are a Jewish atheist, or, or someone who, uh, or a reform rabbi, or whatever the case may be, and at the same time, at the same time, you you refuse this to win. Now, or even someone who's not religious, you allow them to bring them into a Haredi Kiruv Yeshiva. Or so whatever the case may be, there that is a double standard. Okay? It, either you're going to be consistent and judge everyone's um, intentions, or you're not. Now, even that Halakha doesn't talk about judging intentions, it talks about what you see. You see very, very clearly, is a woman fit to study? In other words, is she intelligent? Does she study? And nowadays, Almost all women study. They go to school, they go to university, and so on, and hence they are fit to study Torah. Uh, whereas with also boys, the same thing. You see that if they keep Torah, if they are halakhically observant, whether they're fit to be taught Torah. So that said, um, we then have to. So the question is, on what basis they have to 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 judge um, intentions, and they don't have any basis. Even if they're correct, there has no halachic right to stop a woman taking a, uh, being a teacher of Torah, or a woman bringing up tefillin, or a woman reading a Megillah, even for men, which she is allowed to do, or to, to get an aliyah, and so on and so forth. It's not a question of policy. There's no policy that can change the halacha. The halakha is the halakha. If it is permitted, you don't have the right to prohibit. What you do have the right, and this is where I stress the, the importance of common law, which is very important in Judaism, is that if the community doesn't want it, then it is their right to, to impose that, because that's their community. And democratically, they will state, we don't want that. There is a halakha right for a community to make a takana. But there is no right for one community to force its view on another community. We have to, already from the Middle Ages, we found there were certain groups who took, or rabbis who tried to do this, and the other, to other communities, and the other communities pushed them off. And the rabbis of other communities pushed them off. They said that, you, you know, we are our own, own community. So hence, you cannot state oh, all of Orthodox does one thing. You said who? Or all of jury, religious, uh, halakhic observant jury should do this way, but you can be halakhic observant and do things which orthodox general communities don't necessarily do. It is the right of every community to have their autonomy, and this is very, very important. Um, so now, 
I want to discuss one particular case of in Halakha, and that is the question of Sarah. Women as rabbis, one of the halachic arguments against this. Firstly, let's state that there are plenty of poskim who have stated that women are allowed to uh, be, uh, decide halachic questions. Um, nowadays, if someone is deciding halachic questions, it just means that you have the knowledge behind you. This is what the, the view of the Jewish legal positivists, because we don't view any change of halacha as valid, but rather what the text states until such time as there's a synergy. Is anyone who has the requisite knowledge can tell you what the halacha is. They don't need a fancy title, and they don't need the idea of these uh, uh, semicha certificates, which is a relatively late invention, which was actually opposed by uh, Don Yitzhak Abarbanel. He wrote a letter opposing these tests and, and certificates when he heard that they were being given in Eastern Europe. Nonetheless, Leaving that aside, so anyone who is who knows it may state what the halacha is. People who want to compare this to dayanim to judges are heavily mistaken, because, and we'll actually you know what we'll get to that in a minute. In a minute. Serara. This is the argument that's most often bring women in positions of authority. That's how they sum up the halacha of Sera. And where do they get it from? They get it from Rambam. Because in, in the Sifri, it says, firstly, we'll read the, read the Rambam, and then we'll get to the Sifri. It says in Hilchot Melachim Perat Aleph, uh, depending on the version of the uh, Rambam, Ein Ma'amidin Isha Bemalchuf, Shene'emar Melech, Welo Malka. Okay, we never, it is forbidden, ain means forbidden, to stand a woman in government, in kingship. As it says, melech, it says king, which is, of course, in the language of, uh, of men, it's masculine. Velomalka, it doesn't say woman. Right, and then Rambam says, "V'chein kol misimot of Israel, and simply all appointments that are in Israel, we don't um, put, we don't appoint except a man. We don't put anyone except a man. Okay, there are also other exceptions, gerim, so on, things like that, which we don't necessarily put. Now, the Sifri, everyone asks, oh, where does Rambam get?" All these things. Well, firstly, there are two two assumptions that you find commonly made. Number one assumption is that it means all positions of authority, whereas the implication, even from Rambam itself, that's in Perak, uh, in Melachim, it means political um, appointments, and you absolutely do have a separation in Judaism and. and in, in the Jewish legal system, you have a separation between political appointments and legal appointments and certain things like that, which we'll get to. So they ask, so they're, they're on the assumption that this means all appointments, so then they then ask, where does he get it? Where does he get it from? Because if we look in the Sifri, um, the Sifri on uh, Shoftim, and I'm looking in the the uh, Horowitz and, Lew and Finkelstein edition in Hebrew, it's on Devarim Perak Yudain Asuk Tet Vav, and it says, "Som Tasim Met Mana Achar Tachtav." Yeah, you should put up a point of the So then the halacha says that if he dies, you put another one in his place. Melech Melomaka, a king and not a queen. Right? Then it continues, which isn't relevant to us at the moment. So then. Everyone asks, where does it come from that all appointments? Well, if they would read a bit further down in the very same Sifri, and this is in the Finkelstein and Horowitz edition, it's on page 209. Um, it's on line 8. No, sorry, line 5. Line 5, on page 209, on Shoftim. Devar Acher, another thing, another explanation. Some to Simalech which will surely place upon yourself a king. 
Mesvat Aseh. Right? It's a, it's a, it's a positive command. Lo tuchalatet alecha ish nachri. You're not able to put upon yourselves a foreign man. Mitzvat lo taseh. This is a negative command. Ish nachri. Right? What is this ish nachri? That's a negative command. You can't, um, uh, appoint. Mikan omru ha ish memanim panes ala sipur. Ve enu memanim ha isha panes ala sipur. Okay, from here they learned that the man, can, a man can be appointed as a panas, as a leader of a congregation, and but we don't um, uh, appoint a woman as a panas, as a leader of a congregation. In other words, a political appointment. Congregations had, and to some extent still do, have political appointments. Right? You have a board, you have a chairman, a uh, chairperson, whatever. And you have the board members, you have those, those who have positions of actual authority. Rabbis, just now, Ram is clearly talking about political appointments. We see the Chen Kol Mesimot Israel, we can state, comes from Lo Memanim, Parnes or Parnes. In other words, that is the only source that Ram doesn't make things up. He states things which I always find, we can find in sources. That's the only source we have. Hence, and anyways, in the context of 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 uh, of Malachim, it's talking about the political appointments. It's not talking about rabbinic appointments, and we'll get to this in a minute. So now, the next assumption that's being made is that being a rabbi is a position of authority, as if rabbis have authority nowadays. But they don't. They don't even have real semicha. And even if they did, they wouldn't have authority. The only authorities are bate din, are uh, courts. We find throughout most of Jewish history, and until very recently in Sephardi Jewish history, that rabbis were considered the hacham, the rabbi was considered an advisor and advisor of Jewish law. But the leaders of the community, the Nagid, or the Nasi, or the Parnas, or whatever, whoever it was, they were the leaders. And this was the case also in Europe for a very long time. Now, it could be that the rabbi could also be, at the same time, a Nagid. Right? Rav Shmuel HaNagid was a... Or, um, or of Yehuda Halevi, they were political leaders who were at the same time uh, halachic authority, uh, halachic uh, uh, experts, for lack of a better way, because authority doesn't really fit. Because there's no legislation, you can't have an authority. The only authority can be a locally accepted court, which can make local decrees with on the proviso of the community accepting them. In other words, it's the authority of the community. Now, a rabbi, the assumption that a rabbi is a place of authority, who said it's a place of authority? There is no halakha, right, that that requires me to listen to a modern-day rabbi. There, it's true that orthodoxy, some parts of orthodoxy, take the halachot about having to listen to a teacher, or take the halachot about having to listen to a rabbi who has actual semicha, halachi semicha, or as part of an actual court, and they try to apply this to rabbi nowadays, but the fact is, it doesn't apply. The fact is, is that it's very clear we're talking about real rabbis. And even in the case where they were real rabbis, I don't believe that that's what the halakha of Sarah is talking about. It's just political, right? We have the case of the Dayanim. So why in, in Hilchot Dayanim, why does it not say that a woman is forbidden to be a Dayan, uh, you know, a Shofetet or whatever because of Serara? No one says that. They say it's, forbid they say it's forbidden because a woman is forbidden to be a witness. Of course, she's forbidden to be a witness. She cannot be a, a, um, a judge at the current point in time until Sanhedrin will change that. Obviously, at one point in time, it was possible because Devorah was a Shofetet. That is the Peshat of the Pasuk. And uh, obviously, at some point, the Sanhedrin changed it. Um, you find that many Ashkenazi Rishonim are unaware very often of the axis, time axis, of where the halacha changes, and so hence they, they find this, it is an assumption that halacha was always that way. And then for Tosafot, has to go to you know, the they push them to find an answer. Oh, she wasn't really a Shofet, there were other uh, Shoftim with her, or whatever the, the, the various answers, but the simplest answer is simply that the halacha was changed. Why that happens is a very fascinating question, but it's not a question for this point in time. They could have simply said Sarara, but they didn't. So, Sarara 
to me, and to very many people, simply seems political authority. Um, so that being the case, and anyway, I said it's an assumption that nowadays rabbis have any authority. The only authority that they could technically have is the community accepts that the rabbi has authority to state the halachic uh, actions of the community as a whole, what is done in the Bet Knesset, what is done at the community events, and so on and so forth. Who gets to say the Torah, things like that. That's fine. But that is not the authority of the rabbi, that is the authority of the community. And anyway, the rabbi is really just a servant nowadays, a paid servant of the board and not the community if they're paid uh, which is another question um, but even if they're not paid there's still the fact of the matter is that they're serving a kirila they are not an authority and they don't have any halakhic right to force their view um, in the sense that force their view without the acceptance of the people or things like that so how can it be an authority a political authority in Judaism can force something that people don't like. The kings can do, could have done things that the people didn't like. Um, that still have to be accepted as king by the people in order to be valid. I mean, obviously, if all the, the people don't accept you as king, you're not really a king. But we're talking about they can take actions. You know, say, unlike this, a rabbi can't really do that. And isn't allowed to do that, and, sh and isn't supposed to do that. So the question is, what set arrives there? And anyways, if we're going to get on to political opponents, appointments, so there's a famous, famous Teshuvah, which I really have to bring out, um, because this is a, and you know, I'll put a link in, um, on the YouTube video, on the, linking to an article about this, but um, we know that when the State of Israel was founded, so before that, Rav Cook had forbidden um, women, he thought it was forbidden for women to vote, or to be elected to public office, where, at, to public office whereas the... Um, that uh, Rishon Lassion, the first Sephardi chief from the state of Israel, Chacham uh, Uzia, wrote a very long teshuvah, a very interesting teshuvah, allowing women to vote and allowing them to be elected to public office, without which women would not have had the vote in Israel. And um, without getting into the nitty gritty of it, is that he, even according to Rambam, it's not a problem for women to be elected by vote. By public vote into public office, and he goes to great length to prove this. But I will also make an observation in that these Safari, these scholars of old, like Hamuzia, um, the difference between, for example, Rav Cook and Hamuzia is like this: is that to Rav Cook, well, there's no precedent for women being in public office, therefore it is sure. And whereas for Hamuzia, well, there's no precedent, and therefore it's mutar. There's no precedent forbidding, therefore it's mutar. Whereas for Rukuk, there's no precedent permitting, so it's a so. So the, the legal positivism, just on the positive part, is that um, everything to Ashkenazi, to Ashkenazi Jewish is not always, but very often, you have to uh, prove that something is permitted. And I believe that that is unfortunately mistaken. Now, it's not true of a very, very large amount of Ashkenazi music. I'm just speaking about in a very, very broad and general terms. In fact, the Tiferet Israel, who I mentioned near the beginning of the Shi'ur, is of course Ashkenazi. It says that even in the Torah law, where even a Doraita, the Mahmir has to bring a proof because the Torah doesn't uh, permit, the Torah only comes to prohibit. Uh, and hence, every prohibition is a chidush. Um, so, there's no real. So, the question of authority is the only one I really want to get into. So, so certain halachic details. Are. But returning to the point about women being allowed to do whatever is allowed to them. So, the point is like this: everyone accepts that there are certain halachot which aren't exactly fair to women, and there's also halachot which aren't fair to men. Um, it's very clearly the case if you see the official halachic rights of men in marriage, within a marriage, um, I'm not talking about divorce or marriage itself, the time of marriage, but within a marriage, his rights from his wife, as opposed to her rights from him, 
for example, it's heavily, heavily mounted against the man. Whereas, of course, you have the case with uh, women and not being able to divorce. And so, of course, you have on both sides of things very, very clear uh, things which aren't quite equal. Nonetheless, what the Torah does allow, no one gave anyone permission to prohibit and no one gave anyone permission to judge a person's intentions. Even if you're right, it's not your right to prohibit someone from doing something because you think that they are doing it for the wrong reasons. I think that this idea of leaving people alone as long as they're keeping al they're not keeping al but just leaving people alone is so important in that it, it can't be stressed enough. You find that so many humrot, not all humrot, people say, oh, it protects those who keep al But we find really it doesn't protect those who keep al it doesn't allow a great many more people to keep to be religious, to keep halakha. And hence, the idea of letting each kila, each community decide for themselves, let each person decide for themselves what they want to do, that is, should be the general policy, in my opinion, when it comes to these matters. So, Bezrat Hashem, we shall hopefully see. A rise in um, women women involvement in um, in Torah matters. And speaking about precedents, as I mentioned precedent about women as uh, religious leaders, we do actually have precedent and even post Talmud, without even going as far back as Beruria or the Varanidia, we find much more recently we find Asnath Barzani was appointed as a head of the Yeshiva after her father's and husband. I believe, death in Iraq. She was a Russian, and people and rabbis sent her questions in Halakha. She wrote Teshuvot. We find that the Yavetz, Rav Yaakov Emden, writes about his grandmother, his grandmother was learned, and even brings her opinion in a Halachic Teshuvah. He named also one of his books after her. We find also Rabbinit Miriam, the grandmother of the Maharshal, Rav Shlomo Luria, that she was also a Rosh Yeshiva, in, uh, in, um, in Europe, and she taught Gemara to uh, men, to, to boys. So we find that this, and no one ever worried about Sarara, we don't find massive controversy in the works which discuss these people, we don't find it. We do find by the uh, maid, the Moid von Ludmir, the maiden of Ludmir, it was, she was a Hasidic rebbe, and we find a lot of controversy. Then, um, um, I would put it down to a certain level of chauvinism because even her supporters, the different rebels who supported her, said it because she has the soul of a man inside her, or whatever. But we, but besides that, we do have precedent. We have the same thing as well. It's quoted, for example, in um, in uh, Gabriel Sinner's work, um, Nite Gabriel on Nida. In the introduction, he quotes about uh, the Benish Chai's niece, I believe it was, who married Paravikul Satka, who was the Rosh Yeshiva of Parat Yosef, that she uh, would answer the questions of Nida, a woman would come to her and question Nida. She would check also the um, Marot and all that. That was all done by her. It wasn't done by her husband, it was done by a, a woman, and she was posseged in, in Nida. So on the base, so there is a precedent for this as well. So the, the problem is, so, so people should really, really begin to stop worrying about doing it with the right intentions and just leave people alone. And I think with that, um, that sums up as a very short. I know it's been four, it's a forty minute uh, or however long the video is, but that's a summary of the. Um, the general idea.
the non-general point of view. 